Teamsters Strike, August 9th, 1981. troubles and strikes. San Francisco's general strike gripped the city in a death-like clutch. A gasoline shortage stopped almost every wheel in town. Everyone walked or stayed at home. Serious clashes claimed many victims. Business was paralyzed and hunger threatened the city. While an auto accessory worker strike in Toledo, state guardsmen had to resort to tear gas, lead and cold steel to curb the temper of the strikers. Spurred by radical agitators, tear gas and knockout gas in a stifling barrage which turned the Ohio City streets into an amazing scene of conflict. In Minneapolis, a truck driver strike was climaxed by severe riots and fights between the strikers and the police with many casualties. Warfare in the streets, civic strife at its worst. From the waterfronts of the West to the textile mills of the East, the year 1934 erupted in massive strikes. Among them, one stood out as particularly decisive. Long and bloody, fought for stakes of life and death, it transformed a city and inspired working people across the country. We were just trying to get a living wage for our families because we were really underpaid at the time. So the truckers all went out on strike. Those were not strikes, they were civil wars. There were tremendous violence in them and the uh, impact of it was that the employers were not going to be the masters of the workplace. And that was really what it was all about. It is we who plowed the prairies, built the cities where they trade, dug the mines and built the workshops, endless miles of railroad laid. Now we stand outcast and starving, may the wonders we have made. But the union makes us strong. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. For the union makes us strong. In our hand. Minneapolis, Minnesota. 1929. A pleasant city of lakes and parks, the vibrant commercial hub of an agricultural empire. It has prospered in the 20s. Business and civic leaders are certain that even better times lie just ahead. And yet, all is not well in the city of lakes, for Minneapolis is a city sharply divided. On the one hand, the employers, with their fine homes overlooking the western lakes. On the other, an almost totally non-unionized workforce whose wages are among the lowest in the nation. To prevent unionization, the employers bank on the Citizens Alliance, originally composed of small and middle-sized businesses, now the representative of the largest employers as well, the Alliance combats union organizing by means of the stick and the carrot. They used labor spies, infiltrating labor organizations. They used uh, strong arm methods, physical force. Uh, but then on the other hand, they also used uh, what they called the free employment service. That is to say, they would uh, uh, enable people who wanted jobs to get jobs without paying any fee to some kind of cutthroat employment agency. Few businesses dare break the solidarity of the alliance to negotiate with labor. Those who do find themselves denied loans by the banks which form the backbone of the organization. Since the end of World War I, the Citizens Alliance has enjoyed almost total power. Wages, which rose 11% nationally during the 20s, have risen only 2% in Minneapolis. Once I built the railroad, made it run, made it race against time. Once I built the railroad, now it's done. Brother, can you spare 1930. The American economy stops dead in its tracks. 
shakes with sudden convulsions and rattles slowly backwards. Banks close their doors and businesses collapse. A vast army of hollow-faced men and women without work or hope of income roam the streets, sleep on benches, and beg for bread. Nineteen thirty two. A new president, Franklin Roosevelt, promises government intervention to stimulate the economy. In the short space of these few months, I am convinced that at least four million have been given employment. Or saying it another way, forty percent of those seeking work have found it. That does not mean, my friends, that I am satisfied or that you are satisfied that our work is ended. We have a long way to go, but we are on the way. 1933. Congress passes an economic planning measure, the National Recovery Act. The NRA, though limited in scope, encourages public confidence. At least someone is doing something. Business conditions improve. Unemployment declines modestly, but wages fail to keep pace with rising prices. And in Minneapolis, workers have scarcely been affected. People were desperate. Uh, people were starving, people were on half rations. Uh, uh, well, like, uh, I had a very menial job. I did a little shipping and receiving for the company I worked for and did their local loop deliveries. And I received $16 a week for 44 hours work. My brother drove a truck for Hall Supply Company, a bicycle concern, and he worked. 54 hours a week, uh, nine hours a day, six days a week, for $15 a week. And there were a lot of men uh, trying to raise families on $15 a week, and some even less. Uh, conditions were terrible. Attempts at organizing and strikes by small craft unions are frequent in Minneapolis during 1933, but they meet with little success. Then. A crack opens in the employer's fortress in February of 1934. Local 574 of the Teamsters Union organizes poorly paid workers in the Minneapolis coal yards. Well, in those days, the, um, the people who lived, they didn't have no furnace heat. They had stove heat. And when they ordered coal, the coal had to be carried up to the second, third floor. And the coal the Helpers from the coal yards were sent out and they paid them 35 cents a ton of coal to carry them a fly to carry a ton of flight of stairs. When the employers flatly reject the coal workers' demands for better wages, the union votes to strike. Employing militant tactics to stop the delivery of coal throughout the city, the strikers catch the Citizens Alliance off guard. After two days without coal, the employers relent. Behind the scenes of this first successful strike in Minneapolis in many years lies a conflict on the other side of the world. In Russia, two leaders of the Soviet Revolution have contested bitterly over the course of their country's development. Above the parading troops stands the victorious Joseph Stalin. Exiled in defeat, his opponent, Leon Trotsky. Supporters of Trotsky have emerged as leaders of the Minneapolis coal drivers. Vincent Dunn, a Minnesota-born Irishman, and Swedish immigrant Carl Skoglund have been expelled from the American Communist Party, whose allegiance is to Stalin. The Trotskyists, as Dunn, Skoglund, and their followers in Minneapolis have come to be known, are few in numbers, but skilled and effective organizers. Flushed by their victory in the coal yards, they formulate even more ambitious plans. Carl Skoglund, who I consider to be the master strategist, had laid out a plan to organize the Teamsters Union on an industrial basis rather than on a craft basis where just the driver was involved. And that meant taking in the drivers, the helpers, the warehousemen, anyone connected with the delivery or packaging or warehousing of uh, cargo. Organizing teams begin signing up hundreds of other truckers. 
the strike leaders plan a mass meeting for the 15th of April to publicize their aims. Scheduled to speak at the meeting is Floyd Olson, governor of Minnesota and leader of the Farmer Labor Party, which has united angry farmers with urban workers around a program of radical reform. By the end of the meeting, the union has over 3,000 members. The workers approve wage, hour, and working condition demands and vote to strike if the demands are rejected. Attacking its socialist leadership, the Alliance refuses to recognize the union as a bargaining agent for the workers. The leadership of 574 believes a major strike will move other poor and working people to militant action. But 30,000 Minneapolis workers are without jobs. Their demands for public relief have been met by clubs. They are desperate, a potential army of strike breakers. Aware of this, the Trotskyists persuade Teamster Local 574 to commit the union to the fight for public relief. The unemployed are invited to form their own section of the union. They sign up to serve as pickets instead of strike breakers. On May 15th, with battle plans carefully mapped out, Local 574 of the Brotherhood of Teamsters votes to shut down Minneapolis. The strike headquarters is an old garage. Carloads of cruising pickets are dispatched from the garage to stop all trucks reported moving. A women's auxiliary of strikers' wives works 12-hour shifts to feed thousands of pickets. And we bought, brought kettles down to make this soup and, we, and boards. All the women furnished these things and their knives and things and cut up this, the vegetables for the soup, which was donated to us. And uh, of course, we didn't have any meat, so it was just a vegetable, you know, just regular vegetable soup made out of different carrots and, and cabbage and everything like that. But the men were mo most thankful to get this. I worked in wherever they needed me. I worked in the commissary, which was running 24 hours a day. Uh, I worked in the, um, we had a sort of a hospital set up. And we had a young doctor by the name of Korchik that helped in the, co in the hospital. And we had some nurses, I think, from General Hospital that came down on their free time and also assisted. Sympathetic small business people provide food for the strike kitchen. Bread, for instance, from some of the bakeries. Uh, Layman's Bakery was very uh, generous. Uh, some of the milk companies sent in milk and gave us tickets so they pickets could take milk home for their children. And we'd get rolls, you know, Danish or something like that from the bakeries. I don't think they were strictly fresh, but they were day old. But they were good, and we used them, and we're glad to get them. Even Governor Olson gives $500. But National Teamster President Dan Tobin publicly opposes the strike. He uh, came out and declared that the strike was a wildcat strike and he wouldn't support it. Never gave the union a dime's worth of help. May 17th. The streets of Minneapolis are virtually empty. Sympathetic citizens like Kent Hatcher, a courier for a paper company, let the picket squads know the whereabouts of moving trucks. I was uh, more or less making deliveries around the loop. Uh, and if I would see any merchandise being moved uh, by private car or by small truck, uh, I would call the union headquarters and they would send a few men uh, out to, uh, well, to more or less stop the movement of goods. Secretaries who are sympathetic to the strike listen in to the talk of their employers and give the union information on anti-strike plans. May 18th, the Citizens Alliance calls a citizens rally to protest the strike. 
A law and order committee is appointed to work with city police to stop the picketing. Police arrest dozens of pickets in a sweep of the city. The Citizens Alliance is determined to move trucks and break the strike. Saturday morning, May 19th. Police and hired deputies provide protection for the movement of trucks from the Beerman Fruit Company in the Market District of Minneapolis. Hundreds of unarmed union pickets and spectators argue with the police and try to keep the trucks from moving. Surrounded, the police use force to break up the crowd. At a given signal, the police started to club us. Well, I don't remember much after that because I got hit on the head pretty bad and more than once, obviously. And when I came to, I was laying in the Beerman fruit house on the floor and Harold Beal and Louis Scullard, both fellows of uh, my squad, were also there and they were bleeding pretty heavy. Bruised and battered, the pickets retreat. Enraged, the strikers spend the next day preparing for violent battle. Aware of these preparations, the Citizens Alliance signs up hundreds of new deputies to strengthen the police. Even some prominent businessmen volunteer. Monday morning, May 21st. Several hundred police and deputies confront a comparable number of pickets at the Gamble Robinson Company in the Market District. As trucks begin to move, the battle flares. Suddenly, hundreds of additional strikers armed with bats appear out of nowhere and charge the police. Fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat ensues and continues for hours. In the midst of the fight is a young Chippewa Indian named Happy Holstein, who has come to Minneapolis from the White Earth Reservation. It, it was slaughter. We, we put about 40 in the hospital that morning, uh, uh, Minneapolis police. And I think that, uh, to me, that was the, uh, the beginning of a strike. Uh, uh, show the guys that, you know, that they could do it. And the cops showed us how to, how to swing clubs the, and then the day before, and we learned fast over, we beat them back. And so they shut the gates finally, and you know, we left. Both sides now continue to receive reinforcement. Other Minneapolis unions offer more money and men. The American Legion provides new deputies for the police force. On the morning of May 22nd, two hostile armies meet in the market. As a truck is loaded, the head cracking begins. Police and deputies flee the clubs of the pickets, who soon control the streets. Injured deputies and strikers lie groaning and bleeding on the cobblestones. Two deputies die from the blows they receive. One, C. Arthur Lyman, president of the American Ball Company, is a director of the Citizens Alliance. The battle of deputies run has ended in a rout. A prominent businessman is dead. May 23rd, desperate to restore order, Governor Olson urges Union and Citizens Alliance to negotiate a settlement based on a proposal by the Regional Labor Board. After three days, agreement is reached. The strikers will be unconditionally reinstated on their jobs. A seniority system is established, and employers grant union recognition to a broad range of workers in the industry. On Saturday, May 26th, the jubilant strikers return to work. Structural relations of power have been altered. But the battle for Minneapolis, which now appears settled, has really only begun. Soon disputes arise over the meaning of several clauses in the strike settlement, and again, trouble is brewing. Now, noting that among the leaders of Local 574 are known revolutionaries, the employers charge that the real aim of union demands 
is to bring communism to Minneapolis. Advertisements in the Minneapolis Journal, Star, and Tribune carry dire warnings of communist plotting. They tried to make it a national issue that this was only the foothold, that they would, uh, you let them get by with it here, you let them get it organized, you let these commies get a foothold, and it's just all they need. Uh, they painted a picture of national revolution and everything else. It was, that's how badly and how feelings ran real high. And your papers, uh, they didn't try to, to hold it down a little. They tried to make it <laughs> sound as bad as they possibly could. Upset by what it considers the pro-employer bias of the city's dailies, Local 574 begins its own newspaper, The Organizer. July 6, 1934. Under the slogan, Make Minneapolis a Union Town, several thousand Teamsters and supporters from all the unions in the city parade through downtown and meet at the municipal auditorium. The rally demands that the employers recognize 574 as the bargaining agent for all its members and increase wages or face another strike. The demands are rejected. July 16th. By secret ballot, the union votes to strike and elects a committee to coordinate activities. We had a committee of 100, a strike committee of 100 members and from the rank and file, plus the uh, leaders. And that we, we met every morning, every morning, and laid out our plans for the day. How was the committee chosen? They were, uh, the committee was chosen of what we did, we set up, our setup was that there was a steward in every organization. And the workers in their own plants picked their steward. And these, they were, the committee of 100 was made up mostly of the stewards that the rank and file himself picked. So decisions were made pretty the decisions, the decisions were made democratically. Again, other Minneapolis unions offer support to the strike. Practically all the unions supported us as much as they possibly could. And during the strike, the um, cooks and culinary workers, uh, uh, International was holding their international meeting here in Minneapolis at the time. And I remember that they were the first union that came to our help when they marched down and gave us a check for $1,000 for the strike benefit. The union establishes a special farmer's market so small farmers can sell produce directly to the public. In return, the Farm Holiday Association, which has united farmers against bank foreclosures, pledges its solidarity with the strikers. The working farmer supported us, those that understood what it was all about. And we were fortunate to be in a state where there was an active Farm Holiday Association. The farmers helped us tremendously, and they used to bring in they used to bring in food and supplies and milk in every way. And farmers that understand what it's all about realize that they're workers too, except they ain't got no eight to five day. They start in the morning and they quit at night and it's seven days a week. But the farmers, the farmers around the adjacent area to the Twin Cities were tremendous in their support and help in the 34th strike. July 17th. Pickets fan out from new headquarters in the heart of downtown. They keep the streets nearly free of truck movements. We exempted the milk trucks, any, any outfit that was running under union contract, because we weren't striking them. So we exempted them, the milk and ice, because there was an ice wagon driver's union, Local 221, that had a contract. We let them operate. And the streetcars, and I think the taxi cabs. July 18th, Mayor Bainbridge of Minneapolis urges Governor Olson to mobilize the National Guard in case of new outbreaks of violence. July 19th, Minneapolis Police Chief Michael Johannes orders his men to begin moving goods. The police move a truck without resistance from the Union. Friday, July 20th, 1934, Henry Ness is on picket duty for the Union. He is riding on the back of a pickup with a dozen other strikers when a truck carrying merchandise pulls out from the Slocum Bergen warehouse near the market. The pickup in which Ness is riding moves quickly to intercept the truck. Standing by, a line of policemen 
are ready with their shotguns. We heard the shooting. It was in the middle of the block. The truck would, would have tried to intercept the truck, I'm sure. That was the intent. But nobody got out of the truck, and you, the pictures will show police started open fire on it. Harry and I and Ben Kosky, and I remember Ben because we were all three injured, come out of that alley, and we ran into a policeman who was down on one knee, and he had a sub-Thompson machine riot gun. And just as we come around the corner, he fired. And he knocked Harry DeBoer's leg. We didn't know how bad, but Harry fell down. Ben Kosky's hand was right next to Harry's leg, and he pretty near severed it. And I got the balance of the charge, the lacerations in the uh, uh, stomach area, and uh, I got some cracked ribs out of it. I thought I was killed because I was bleeding, but it was just surface wounds, it turned out to be. We got Harry, got him up to the strike headquarters, we got Kosky there, and everyone went to different hospitals. At their home, Moe and Rose Hork receive an emergency telephone call urging them to come to headquarters. It was bedlam when we got there. It was, a, it was turmoil. These boys were shot in the back. They were moaning and groaning. The doctor uh, was trying to get to all of them. The nurses were working. And we were flying around getting supplies for them for those that were attending the sick. It was pretty bad that day, very bad. 67 persons wounded by the bullets of the police. Two will die. The first is Henry Ness, 40 years old, the father of four children. Tuesday, July 24th, tens of thousands of strikers and sympathetic citizens line the streets for the funeral of Henry Ness. I was standing on the sidelines watching it go by like the rest of us, most of us was, but there was quite a parade following this procession downtown, and there was people, those wall-to-wall -wall people on each side of the street, you know what I mean, for quite a distance down there. But it was a real sad day for the truckers and everybody. But... Uh, it was really a large funeral, the largest one I ever saw in my life. Thousands of marchers follow the body of Ness to a North Minneapolis cemetery. As a veteran of World War I, Ness is buried with full military honors. Mixed emotions now swell in the strikers and their families. I was rather frightened every night. I could, didn't know after they had shot these uh, other strikers and that, how he'd come home or if he ever would come home. Uh, I, I was re terrified. Uh, it, I was thinking of I and the baby being left all alone and um, I didn't know what in the world I would do because I wasn't equipped for any work of any kind, educated in that way. So it was, uh, it was rough having him out there. I'd, I'd wait from the time he went to the strike till the time he got home. Just nothing but a bundle of nerves. And then I'd, I'd listen continually on the radio. Then I'd hear all this stuff going on and it was terrifying. Then came a terrible period of uh, uh, not frustration, but anger among the ranks. And the leaders had a problem because they were uh, real concerned that several of the guys would want to uh, get even with that. That was cold-blooded murder, what they'd done. That was cold-blooded murder. The events of July 20th, Bloody Friday, galvanize neutral public opinion to the side of the strikers. Eric Severide, then a Minnesota University student, 
writes that he is as close to becoming a practicing revolutionary as he ever will be. Protest rallies even attract small businessmen as advocates of a continued strike. Fearing further violence, Floyd Olson orders the National Guard into the city. Wednesday, July 25th. Two federal mediators, Father Francis Haas and E. H. Dunnigan, offer a proposal which comes very close to union demands. The strikers answer yes to the plan by an overwhelming vote. We will not deal with this communist leadership, replies the Citizens Alliance. After bitterly castigating the Alliance for its refusal to accept the Haas Dunnigan plan, an angry Floyd Olson declares martial law. Thousands of young National Guardsmen fill the street. Like 19 year old Alan Vickerman, they wield rifles and machine guns that they are not trained to use. I never shot a machine gun in my life. Even out of Fort Ripley, we never, they never had any training on the outside of the fact that you knocked it down and cleaned it and put it back together again. We rode around uh, six men to a squad, sometimes five, one lieutenant, two Thompson machine guns, and the sidearms. For several days, the guardsmen patrol the city. Whatever Floyd Olson's personal intentions, martial law is breaking the strike. The guardsmen are not effective in keeping the streets closed to trucking. By August 1st, 70% of normal truck traffic is moving. The union holds a street meeting challenging martial law. In response, Olson orders the guard to union headquarters. Three leaders of 574, Bill Brown, Vincent Dunn, and Miles Dunn, and 68 other strikers are arrested. Feeling betrayed by a governor they thought sympathetic to their cause, hundreds of other strikers roam the streets, turning over trucks and confronting guardsmen. The young soldiers are frightened, but they hold their fire. I mean, you, you got a whole bunch of people coming at you and you got live ammunition. And you don't know if there's a machine, even at 50 feet, or at a, and even at 100 yards, you're, you're shooting probably in a three-foot circle. Now, you shoot a bunch of ammunition at somebody like that. I mean, you're, you're, going to, you're going to kill somebody. You're not just going to shoot them in the knee, you know. And I wondered what I was going to do. I never had to pull the trigger, but I wondered what I had to, what I was going to feel like afterwards. The organizer calls for a general strike. Still free leaders of Local 574 agree to meet with Olson to discuss the strike. They firmly demand the release of Brown and the Duns. Needing labor support in the coming election, Olson complies. Now, Olson orders the guard to tighten up on truck traffic and to raid the Citizens Alliance headquarters. He hopes the raid will convince the employers to agree to the Haas Dunnigan plan. We will not surrender to communism, the employers reply. They file an injunction suit to stop martial law, but the courts reject it. Still, Heavy truck traffic continues despite the National Guard. Cruising pickets who violate martial law in an attempt to stop trucks are arrested by the Guard and sent to a stockade set up at the state fairgrounds. Conditions are primitive. At first, the strikers sleep under the stars. As their spokesman, Mo Hork demands tents and other amenities. And the request was fulfilled. They come in there with a couple of truckloads and they just dumped them on the ground and drove away and that was it. So I sent word that I wanted to see him and he came and I told him to send in a detail to put him up. And he says, why won't you put him up? And I told him that it was government property and we're not gonna mess with government property. And it didn't take very shortly, there was a detail came in, the tents were set up, the cots were put in there, the blankets were unbundled, and we had shelter and we had food. And uh, I also asked him about uh, recreation, as these people ain't gonna sit around in there. They had uh, what he called sharpshooters, I don't know, maybe some of them couldn't hit the side of a barn if they'd shoot at it. And they had them all the way around. So, 
he got us some softballs and cards and things like that. And I asked him, how about some baseball bats? And he says, these boys are too handy with them. They know how to handle them too good. So we couldn't have no bats. The strike enters its fourth week, having become a battle of wills. By now, the trucking firms are hurting. Many are anxious to agree to the haas Dunnigan plan. Some do, but Citizens Alliance pressure keeps the major companies from signing. August 8, 1934. President Franklin Roosevelt visits Rochester, Minnesota. Floyd Olson hurries to meet with him. They spend four hours discussing the truck strike crisis. After Olson and Roosevelt confer, Jesse Jones, chairman of the New Deal's Reconstruction Finance Corporation, calls the leading bankers of Minneapolis. Father Haas claims that what uh, Jones said to uh, these business leaders in Minneapolis and bankers in Minneapolis was that if the strike were not settled within two weeks, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation would call in all of the outstanding loans to Twin Cities banks and railroads. But in the end, it is the persistence and militant tenacity of the strikers which proved too strong for the Citizens Alliance to resist. On August 13th, the employers offer a compromise plan, but the strikers smell victory and reject it. On August 19th, the Citizens Alliance agrees to the essentials of the haas Dunnigan plan. And in 34, I think we got an increase up to about $33 or approximately that figure at that time. So we could probably take care of our families a little bit better because we was working a 48-hour week. And for $18 a week, we just weren't making both ends meet. Well, after the strike, when he did get a, this raise, of course, we could, I, we bought me the first washing machine I ever had with a dollar down and so much at the town market. And I was uh, enthralled. I was so happy to have this washing machine. <laughs> and that was the first and only thing I ever owned that uh, could call my own. Otherwise, it was rented apartments and everything was furnished. The success of the truck strike leads to the rapid unionization of other Minneapolis industries and sparks labor organizing from Rhode Island to Washington State. Troubled by the mounting disorder, Congress takes notice and passes the Wagner Labor Relations Act of 1935, which guarantees workers rights to bargain collectively through unions. The Battle of Minneapolis is a turning point for labor. When we think about the events of 46 years ago and the toll it took, but the mighty change that it brought about, it's like a, a major earthquake that alters events for decades, literally centuries to come. Hello, Sean. How are you? Sean. Hello, happy. Go on over and get well, the oh, 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 I'm talking about the wild Indian. <laughs> well, I started in 28. So. Well, I was working part time in, in the summer, so I started hauling coal in 1935, and I got six bits an hour. You know, I thought that was maybe big wages. Then oh. Oh. <laughs> you can make 40, 50 bucks a week with overtime and sure. work with a few months. That's a big money. Yeah. for the last 35 years? Nowadays, I wouldn't even buy a good meal. Oh, that is but you know, it brings back a lot of memories. Oh, if they had a war, uh, this town would have been an open shop <laughs> cab town, and it wouldn't have been for us. Yeah. And really oh, yeah, well, and not only this town alone. The whole world, the whole this nation. Town, the whole world, the whole nation, because we, if you remember, what our, the meetings we used to have, and we always set one ironclad rule, you don't cross the picket line. And this is what made all the rest of the unions, not only here in Minneapolis, but all over the country, and from here it spread through throughout the world and a lot of other countries. And I always feel that this wasn't a strike, it was a civil war. Right. And if you remember, we took a vow at that time that we are going to win, and we did. We did. And we fought everybody. That's right. You got to get the... On July 20th, 1980, 
The Minneapolis truck strike is memorialized for the first time at a picnic in a city park. More than a hundred living veterans of those tumultuous days of 1934 are in attendance. They're awarded medallions commemorating their participation in the strike. Jack Maloney. Minneapolis, Minnesota, 1981. It is a cheerful and prosperous city now. Standard of living and quality of life for working people are high by national standards. But on this Minneapolis street, in an industrial district, there is no monument to remind passers-by that what happened here almost 50 years ago transformed the city and played a decisive role in the history of organized labor in America. That on this street, over 50 unarmed men were shot by police and two of them died. The bloodstains are gone from this street now and in the minds of most people, it is just another street. But for men like Jack Maloney, who spent much of his working life as a labor organizer, the sound of gunfire they heard here on a hot July day in 1934 will echo in their memories for as long as they live. Well, it made me, instead of just being a, uh, shall I say, happy-go-lucky truck driver that was just uh, rooting around, it made me think more seriously of what the whole thing is all about. That there's more in life than just going out and getting yourself a 50 cent an hour job or a $50 a week job, depending on the, you know, the uh, wages of the times. I said, there's gotta be something more to this. We have to make the workers realize that through the organized strength of unions, they can achieve a better way of life. It is we who plowed the prairies, built the cities where they trade, dug the mines and built the workshops, endless miles of river lay. Now we stand outcast and starving, with the wonders we have made. But the union makes us strong. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. For the union makes us strong. In our hands lies the power greater than their hoarded gold, greater than the might of armies, magnified a thousandfold. We can bring to birth a new world from the ashes of the old, for the 